let's get started. Um, as you all know, I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we are pleased to host the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services, and have been doing so since 1983. Um, so thank you all for being a part of this very successful program. Um, and I'll introduce today's speaker. Ashley Barnes-Gilbert is a lecturer and soon-to-be assistant professor in the Women's and Gender Studies at UW-Whitewater. She is a historian of women, gender, and sexuality in the United States. Her research explores brothels and their role in the turn of the century southern and midwestern river towns. She received her PhD from uh, the <laughs> program in women's history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as the George L. Massey Scholar of LGBTQ History. Ashley teaches a wide variety of courses at UW-Whitewater, including Introduction to Women's and Gender Studies, Feminist Theories, Women, Race and Ethnicity, and Women in Work. She has expertise in women's and gender history and, th and race and ethnicity ethnic history of the United States. Please welcome Ashley Barnes-Gilbert. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here and to be back here. Um, I was sad to see some of these having to move online during the pandemic, and I'm super excited to be back in community with y'all uh, today. Um, we're going to be talking today about somebody who does not get a whole lot of recognition for the work that they have done for social justice movements in the United States. Their name is Polly Murray. I never learned about Polly Murray until I got to college, and even then, I only heard about Polly Murray in one class. Class. It was my feminist theories class um, at my small school, Rhodes, where I got to read one of Polly Murray's articles on the history of Jane Crow, which is a term you're going to be learning about in today's conversation. What I find interesting is that Polly Murray is an incredible human being who was uh, survived a lot of difficulties in their life and made a huge difference in multiple different social justice movements, including movements for economic equity, for racial equality equality, for LGBTQ equality, and for feminism. And yet, Polly Murray is often not written into these mainstream stories of this social justice activism. And the question I want to ask in particular for today's conversation is why, and how can we recover the beautiful life of Polly Murray to explain more about what it means to live at the intersections of oppression and to fight for a more just and equitable world? So I'm going to start by giving you just a little bit of context on Polly Murray, which also includes a conversation about the way that I refer to Murray throughout today's conversation. As the title of my talk suggests, Murray lived life at the intersections. What does this mean? Intersectionality indicates that a person experiences oppression not just because of one social location, but instead from multiple sites places that are intersecting and shaping their ability to navigate the world both interpersonally and institutionally. The term itself is gonna be a part of today's conversation. The reason why is because Murray is one of the earliest scholars, lawyers in particular, who gave us evidence of the need to recognize intersectional social positionings, particularly within the law. But yet, Murray is not credited for their work as a black person. Murray wrote about this issue because they themselves experienced a multifaceted identity. They were widely identified by many people as being African American, although they identified more often as being black. They talk in their autobiography called Proud Shoes about how they have a diverse racial background. Their ancestors include both freed and um, enslaved black persons, white slave owners, indigenous persons, Irish people, and more. In their um, autobiography, they talk about how when their family comes together for a family reunion, it's like a United Nations in miniature. In addition, Murray was part of the LGBTQ community. As a historian, identifying an LGBTQ person in the past can be quite difficult because the language surrounding LGBTQ lives has shifted. In Murray's life, as I will discuss, it's clear that Murray dealt with both gender dysphoria, meaning they did not identify with the gender they were assigned to birth, which was female, and did not identify as being heterosexual. But historians, museums, and even politicians have really struggled and debated about how they can identify Murray because of this evidence. 
When Murray was alive, they did use she, her pronouns, but in all of their writings, indicated that they did not identify as being female. So some museums and some centers have done different things. Uh, the National Museum of African American History utilizes she, her pronouns to talk about Murray, saying that's what Murray used while they were alive, and so they think that's the clearest way to identify Murray. For me, this is a little bit of a concern because in most of the mainstream autobiographies, or biographies, not autobiographies, of Murray's life, Murray is never recognized as being LGBTQ. And so in some ways, using the she, her pronouns furthers that erasure as opposed to recognizing their gender nonconformity. The Polly Murray Center, which is dedicated to the preservation of Murray's life and legacy, utilizes she, he pronouns. So every time they talk about Murray, they use she, he because Murray did not solely identify as a woman. In today's talk, I'm going to primarily utilize they, them pronouns. Uh, the goal here is to recognize that Murray was not identifying as being cisgender and instead uh, would likely be seen as being a trans man today if that language had been available to Murray during their lifetime, but it wasn't. And so to try to make sure that we render the full complexity of Murray's life visible, I'm going to use they, them pronouns throughout today's conversation, recognizing this isn't a perfect solution, but one that helps us recover a bit more about Murray's life and life at the intersections. We really can't know exactly how Murray would identify today, but part of the significance of their life does lie in the fact that they belong to the LGBTQ plus community, and so it's important to make that visible in today's conversation. In today's talk, I'm going to demonstrate how Murray contributed to several social justice movements in the 20th century. Most of their work predated others including lunch counter sit-ins, challenging segregation on public buses, writing about the intersections of sexism and racism, and fighting for economic, racial justice, feminism, and LGBTQ equity. But they've largely been written out of these stories, both when they were alive and also now posthumously after they have passed on. One of the reasons why I argue they've been written out of these stories is because of a kind of politics called respectability politics. This is the idea that social justice movements should put forward the people who experience the least amount of oppression and might be the most sympathetic to those who don't support their cause. Murray was no such person. Murray challenged all the norms of their era. Murray challenged racial norms, Murray challenged gender norms, Murray challenged sexual norms, Murray challenged political norms. And so Murray was not seen as being respectable. And in that process, Murray has been left out of stories about the long civil rights movement, stories about the history of American feminism, stories about the rights of LGBTQ equity. And I hope through things like this talk and other forms of writing, we can start engaging the recovery of Polly Murray and the full complexity of their life. So to start, we're going to go to Murray's childhood. Murray has a really difficult, tragic life to uncover. We have a picture here on the right-hand side with a nice purple um, indicating who Murray was among their family. They were the fourth of six children. Their parents, um, they were born in uh, November 20th, 1910 in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and their parents were the nurse, Agnes Fitzgerald, and uh, a teacher, William Murray. But both of their parents died when Murray was quite young. In fact, her mother died quite quickly and suddenly when she was only four years old of a cerebral hemorrhage. And their father actually developed typhoid fever when Murray was just 11 years old and had complications from typhoid that resulted in their father being committed into a mental health institute. Whilst in that institute, their father suffered a lot of um, violence, particularly at the hands of white guards, and was actually murdered by one of those guards in the basement of that mental health institute when Murray was just 13 years old. This tragedy is one that Murray talks about in their own work, so if you're interested in hearing about it from Murray's own words, you can read Proud Shoes, which is their autobiography. It's a really beautiful piece um, that talks about the difficulties of their childhood and what they went through. 
After the death of both of their parents, all six children were split among relatives, and so Murray didn't see their siblings um, hardly at all from that point forward, and was placed with their maternal aunt, um, Aunt Pauline Fitzgerald, who they were named after, and lived with their maternal grandparents, Robert George and Cornelia Smith Fitzgerald in Durham, North Carolina. This is their childhood home here on the left. Murray's aunt was a school teacher and taught Mary, Murray to really prioritize their education. Murray loved to learn. They were an early reader, learning how to read by the age of three. And by the time they graduated from high school, had held at least 10 leadership roles in their high school and also had a perfect straight A GPA. Murray went to school in North Carolina where Jim Crow segregation was fully on display, and thus they were forced to attend a school that was only for black students. North Carolina had a law in place that meant that schools that were dedicated to students of color could only go through the 11th grade. And so Murray had a high school degree, but it was only through the 11th grade, which would prove an issue for Murray later in their life. When Murray wanted to look forward to trying to expand their education, they wanted to leave Jim Crow South. Murray was really cognizant of the fact that racial segregation was limiting what options they were going to have in their future. And so they set their eyes on New York City. Initially, they wanted to go to Columbia, but quickly realized that Columbia did not accept women. Not for the last time, Murray realized that um, what it was like to live at the intersections often meant facing lots of barriers and being a trailblazer even when you don't want to be. They were not deterred, however, um, and started to look at schools that would accept women. Barnard reached out to Murray, knowing about their incredible record, but Barnard was quite expensive, and Murray had no funds, no support from family, any way to actually support their way through college, and so instead, Murray chose the more affordable Hunter College in New York City. When attempting to apply, however, Murray found that uh, North Carolina had greatly shortchanged them. That uh, high school degree was in fact not a high school degree according to New York State, which meant that if Murray wanted to go to college in New York, they would have to return to high school once again. They chose to do so, and they completed their 12th year of high school, which was rather redundant but necessary for them to go to college at an entirely white school where they were the only African American in attendance. Murray then applied to Hunter College, got a partial scholarship, and graduated in 1933 with a degree in English literature. It's during this time that Murray actually changed their birth name. I don't mention their birth name because they don't identify as such, and I don't want to uh, identify them as in a way that they don't want to be, so their name is now Polly. And in this time, they underwent a great deal of hardship. There's a lot of writings in their diaries about mental health issues, uh, feeling really misunderstood as someone who did not feel like that they were actually a woman, despite being identified as such, and um, exploring their first love their first love with other women. So for Murray, their life was not easy, um, both personally, but also within the larger structure of U.S. history. You might note, graduating in 1933 meant that they graduated in the height of the Great Depression. Murray suffered a lot in college trying to work their way through. They had to work as a waitress for the most part to be able to afford to attend college and often went without food themselves at one point having to take a six-month break at a hospital because they were suffering from malnutrition. And yet Murray persevered and was able to um, emerge with a degree in 1933 looking to make a wife for themselves uh, far beyond um, what they had seen their family do. In the post-college period, I call this moment in their lives the making of an activist. They graduated in the worst labor market in American history, which as a 2008 college graduate is saying something. Uh, they were unable to find steady employment. And in fact, in Harlem where they lived, about 50% of Harlem residents were unemployed. During this time, Murray was exposed to labor rights, the labor rights movement, which became a huge component of their activism for years to come. They briefly worked for the Works Progress Administration and even for just one year joined the Communist Party. Um, they didn't like the Communist Party though because they thought that the, the lines were too rigid and they wanted to have a little bit more freedom and how they could express their politics. So they left after just one year. 
Eventually they thought, like many of us graduates from college do who can't find jobs, maybe grad school's the answer. So they decided to apply to a graduate program in sociology at the University of North Carolina. Just six days after they submitted their application, they were denied. In the letter of recommendation, the school noted, Dear Miss Murray, I write to state that members of your race are not admitted to the university. Keep that language in mind, because this is not the last time Murray's gonna be told this particular thing. Murray wanted to sue. Um, they asked the NAACP to represent them, but the NAACP thought Murray's case was not strong enough because they didn't live in North Carolina, they lived in New York State. Murray continued working, honing their skills as an activist and what they would eventually become a powerful author and writer. And by 1940, made a seemingly innocuous decision to visit their family in North Carolina. This decision was not meant to change their life, but it did. Specifically, they were hoping um, to return to North Carolina for the Easter holidays. In March of 1940, they, they boarded a southbound bus. Um, in New York, quite reluctantly. Um, they brought one of their best friends along with them and they were hoping that they would have a nice trip to Durham without too much difficulties navigating the Jim Crow South. But of all the segregated institutions in the South, Murray has often been well known as saying that she hated the bus the most. She said that the intimacy of the space, quote, permitted the public humiliation of black people to be carried out in the presence of privileged white spectators who witnessed our shame in silence or indifference. After changing buses in Richmond, Virginia, Murray and their friend found themselves on a bus where the seats in the segregated section were broken. So there was no way for them to actually sit in the section that was designated for people of color. As such, they moved to the whites only section. In their own retelling of this event, Murray noted that their friend um, and them had been having a conversation about the best practices for protesting injustices. Gandhi and nonviolence resistance had been a predominant part of that conversation. And thus, when the bus driver asked them to move, they refused. The driver called the police, they dragged them off the bus, threw them on the ground, and Murray and their friend were thrown in jail. This time, the NAACP responded. They wanted to use Murray's case to challenge the constitutionality of segregated interstate travel. But Virginia lawyers were smart and they wanted to avoid such a challenge. So they charged Murray and their friend with solely a local ordinance of disorderly conduct. And Murray was found guilty, was fined $43, which they did not have, and was sent back to jail for a week. When Murray was released, they were incensed and vowed to never return to Virginia again. That was not a promise they would keep, as we'll talk about here in a moment. This was the first case of many for Murray. They began their journey as an activist through the violence of state segregated institutions and slowly began to perform their perspective, form their perspectives about what it meant to challenge oppression at the intersections for all persons, not just for themselves. Six months after this arrest, Murray began work on a very famous case of Odell Waller. Murray found themselves back in Virginia, much against their will, they didn't wanna be there, but the Workers' Defense League had said, we really need you to raise money for this young man. He has been wrongfully convicted, he's imprisoned in Virginia, and he's going to be executed within six months. So Murray, in the hope of helping Waller, returned to Virginia. Waller, just for some context, had been sentenced to death for shooting um, their white landlord who they had been sharecropping under. The landlord had taken all of the earnings from that year's yield and had tried to kick Waller off of the land and in the process had hurt some of Waller's family members. Waller shot the white landlord in self-defense, that was his claim. He was tried by an all white male jury who convicted him within 20 minutes of receiving the case. They um, argued that Waller had killed his sharecropper in cold blood and that he was a murderer who deserved to be executed immediately. This was a case that was making national news, so people around the nation were hearing about it, including the famous Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor Roosevelt and FDR had still been in power during this period and um, knew Polly Murray well. 
Uh, Polly Murray was never one to throw, to not throw punches. And after FDR had given a particularly rousing speech about challenging fascism abroad, Murray thought that FDR needed to be, to be reminded about the problems here at home. And so Murray wrote a letter to FDR telling him that he cared far more about fascism abroad than white supremacy at home. FDR didn't respond, but Eleanor Roosevelt did. Uh, she thought this was quite an interesting letter, and she appreciated the challenge to her husband, so she invited Murray to tea. The two developed a very contentious but important relationship that became a decade-long friendship where they worked together on multiple different initiatives to both uh, try to challenge racial and gender inequality. While raising money in Virginia, um, Murray was put on the speaking block, was forced to go around, right, from school to school, politician to politician, and give impassioned speeches to get money raised for Waller's defense fund. At one of these speeches, Murray moved the audience to tears. Murray was very well known for being a powerful orator and a beautiful speaker. By chance, the audience that day included Thurgood Marshall, and Howard Law professor Leon Ransom. The New Yorker describes the incident after the talk. Later that day, Murray was walking around downtown Richmond, and they ran into two men, Ransom and Thurgood Marshall. They had admired her speech and suggested that she apply to Howard Law School. Murray replied that they would if they could afford it, but they can't. So Ransom turned and said, if you apply, I will get you a full ride scholarship. And Thurgood said, if you apply, I'll write your letter of recommendation. So Murray did. Murray applied to Howard, was immediately admitted, given a full ride, per all of the support from both Leon Ransom and Thurgood Marshall. And by the time Odell Waller's case was closing, um, his final appeal was denied, and he died in the electric chair. Murray was starting day one of law school at Howard. She was quoted as saying her single-minded intention was to destroy Jim Crow. It would become that her single-minded intention was not just to destroy Jim Crow, but what she would come to known as Jane Crow. So let's turn to Murray's life in law school. In law school, Murray joined several different organizations to protest race, racial segregation, joining many of the big names in the long civil rights movement. One of the biggest was that Murray co-founded the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, with George Hauser, James Farmer, and Bayard Rustin. But their time at Howard was not very happy. Rather, Murray consistently uh, encountered issues with sexism. As you note in this picture, Murray is the only seemingly female-identified persons in their class at Howard Law School. And in fact, for the most part, they were the only female who would have been admitted to Howard Law School during this time period. On their first day of classes as a 1L, one of their professors announced to his class that he didn't know why a woman would want to go to law school, a comment that both humiliated Murray and guaranteed, as they recalled, that, quote, I would become the top student. Others questioned Murray's aptitude for law, and Murray found that there was kind of a constant interpersonal and institutional sexism that was holding them back. Despite this, Murray continued to thrive and fight, and they graduated valedictorian of Howard Law School in 1944. With this degree, they earned the Rosenwald Fellowship. This is an award that's only given to the valedictorian of the graduating class of Howard Law School, and it's meant to support black scholars and artists in pursuit of additional degrees. The previous valedictorians had all been male, and what this meant was a full ride to Harvard. But for Polly Murray, that was not the case. Murray applied to Harvard and was immediately rejected, just like at UNC. She received a letter that read very similar to the letter she received from the University of North Carolina, and it said, you are not of the sex entitled to be admitted to Harvard Law School. Murray responded, quote, gentlemen, I would gladly change my sex to meet your requirements, but since the way to such a change has not been revealed to me, I have no recourse, but to appeal to you to change your minds on this subject. Are you to tell me that one is as difficult as the other? Harvard refused to admit Murray, and instead, Murray went to the University of California Bolt School of Law, or UC Berkeley, and there received a Master's of Law degree 
Their master's thesis was titled The Right to Equal Opportunity in Employment. They spent a couple years in California being the first black female attorney general of California in that process, but then returned back to the East Coast with the goal of influencing politics and trying to challenge once and for all the horrific world of Jim Crow segregation. Murray's lengthy experience with dual discrimination of being both black and viewed as a woman really greatly shaped their growing activist work. While in law school and at UNC, or USC, Murray coined a term that would become the phrase that influenced their activism for years to come. The term was Jane Crow. By the 1940s, many were familiar with the concept of Jim Crow. This emerged from the failure of Reconstruction after the American Civil War. And it was a series of black codes that basically prevented African Americans uh, from being able to move freely in public spaces. Rather than have freedom, many African Americans found themselves yoked to new threats, ranging from criminalization to racialized violence to legal segregation laws that really limited their movements and rights. Murray had been fighting Jim Crow, largely through challenging racial segregation in public spaces. They predated the protest by Rosa Parks um, by about 20 years, right, with their, their protest on public segregation uh, buses. Yet Murray found that no one seemed to be discussing how Jim Crow differed for black women. Murray is quoted as saying the following, black women historically have been doubly victimized by the twin immoralities of Jim Crow and Jane Crow. Murray added that black women faced with these dual barriers have often found that sex bias is more formidable than racial bias. Murray lived life at the intersections of racism and sexism, and Murray's experiences with systemic oppression cannot be limited to just one aspect of their identity. Murray has to be understand, understood as experiencing oppression from multiple locations, really limiting their abilities to move in the world and also shaping their resilience and fight to belong. Throughout their career, many things changed for Murray. They had a really hard time finding steady work, and in fact, it was almost impossible for them to hold down a job for more than two years, um, often being let go or replaced uh, by someone who was white or someone who was male, or usually both. Throughout their career, though, one thing remained constant in Murray's life, and that was their pen. Murray was a prolific author who has written multiple different law review articles, multiple different books, books of poetry, and more. One of those was in 1951, where Murray published State's Laws on Race and Color. This was uh, considered to be a definitive work on challenging state segregation laws. The project was actually commissioned by the Methodist Church, the women's division of the Methodist Church in New York City. They opposed segregation, and they wanted to figure out if they could legally challenge it in some way, right, in the 31 states where they had parishes. So they hoped that Murray, they were going to pay her about $20 to create a small six-page pamphlet that they could pass out to these different 30 um, institutions, these 30 states, right? Um, Murray did not create a six-page pamphlet. They wrote a 746-page book uh, that was published in 1951. This book was uh, seen by Thurgood Marshall as being the strongest book to talk about the need for deconstructing and challenging racialized legal segregation. In fact, Marshall had so many copies of this book in the NAACP Defense and Education Fund's headquarters that people were using them as tables because uh, they had them stacked up on each other. Marshall, in fact, also said that this was the book that allowed them to argue Brown versus Board of Education. They used this book and about 90% of the writing and the decision of Brown versus Board that they were fighting is from Polly Murray. They are not cited as an author in Brown versus Board, but Marshall indicates, right, that this was what they called the Bible of the Brown versus Board of Education argument and decision. In 1956, as you can see here, Murray published their first autobiography. They would have a second that was published posthumously. I recommend picking this one up if you're interested in autobiographies. It's a beautiful piece called Proud Shoes, the story of an American family. Here they are depicted with their publishers um, talking about the book. The second book um, is titled Song in a Weary Throat, An American Pilgrimage. 
both are not easy to read, right? Murray's life was not an easy life, and there's a lot of trauma um, in their experiences, but they're powerful, beautifully written pieces that allow us to recover the stories of people who've experienced racialized harm, sexism, homophobia, and more. So I recommend uh, picking up this piece. Murray bounced around different careers, even teaching law at the University of Ghana for five years, but their pen remained their constant. By the 1960s, Murray had become a well-known activist, challenging not only the racism of white people, but the sexism of civil rights activists. While in Ghana, Murray was writing critiques of the civil rights movement from afar, especially critiquing Murray's old friend, Bayard Rustin. There was an amazing March on Washington that most people were celebrating as an incredible advancement in the long civil rights movement. But Murray disagreed. Murray thought, why are we engaging in such a brilliant movement for racial equality and not bringing everyone to the table in that conversation? In one letter to Rustin, she noted the following. It is indefensible to call a national march on Washington and send out a call which contains the name of not a single woman leader. I have been increasingly perturbed over the blatant disparity between the major role which Negro women have played and are playing in the crucial grassroots levels of our struggle and the minor role of leadership they have been assigned in national policymaking decisions. Murray called out the leaders of the civil rights movement on their sexism. They noted that you're willing to use, even exploit the work of female leaders in our local communities to build up your movements, but never raise them up to be part of the national leadership of the civil rights movement. This didn't make Murray many friends, but it did make others take notice of her. One of those was President Kennedy who realized that Murray was doing something different than others in their critique. Murray wasn't just interested in kind of the status quo, but really pushing the movement to be as intersectional as possible. And so Kennedy actually appointed Murray to the Committee on Civil and Political Rights as part of the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women. And it's through this work that Murray started to work on the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Murray was still in Ghana while appointed to this particular commission, but that didn't stop them from uh, writing a lot um, about what it was that needed to be done uh, with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Murray was among a group of feminist lawyers who were developing legal strategies to move forward on women's rights. There was a lot of debates happening about this landmark civil rights legislation, and this group of women wanted to really seize on the chance to provide some legal protections for women that had not been in place so far. The word sex was actually a last minute addition to Title VII, which prohibits workplace discrimination of the House's version of the Civil Rights Act, and it was expected to be removed by the Senate. The initial wording of this particular amendment said that you could not engage in employment discrimination according to a person's race, color, religion, or national origin. The amendment added in sex. This group of feminist lawyers tapped Murray to write a memo in support of retaining sex that would be sent to lawmakers and to White House officials. The remaining work became one of Murray's most famous. Um, it was a George Washington Law Review article. You can still purchase it. Um, it's about 70 pages, so you can buy it on Amazon if you want to. Um, and it's titled Jane Crow and the Law, Sex Discrimination and Title VII. The article highlighted comparisons between laws that discriminated on the basis of race and those that discriminated on the basis of gender arguing that the application of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 could be used to combat both forms of discrimination, not just one. This particular work is thought of as being foundational to the challenge of the law to be more intersectional. But today, Murray is rarely recognized with this, with this um, contribution. Today, when people talk about intersectionality in the law, they cite renowned and incredible activist and employment discrimination lawyer, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. But Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality in the late 1980s, was working off of Polly Murray.
And Crenshaw doesn't often recognize that they owe a lot of debt to Polly Murray. But if we really want to provide a context for how the fight to make the law more intersectional has occurred, we have to give Polly Murray their due. They are the origins of this battle. In 1965, Murray decided to return back to the United States. They wanted to earn their Doctor of Jurisdicial Science. As I said, they really liked to get an education. And they went to Yale Law School for doing so. At Yale, Murray mentored several young female activists, including Marian Wright Edelman, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Patricia Roberts Harris, who all became leaders in their own right. In addition, she began to form a relationship with the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In this time, she started to get really frustrated about how little progress that she felt and others felt that women were making towards equity in the United States. Murray gave a speech in New York that uh, argued that women should march on Washington, just like African Americans had done just a few years before. The suggestion was met largely with raised eyebrows, except for one person, Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan called Polly Murray and invited Friedan Murray to a conference on women's rights. Friedan, if you don't know who she is, was the author of The Feminine Mystique. And 1965 was probably one of the most famous, well-known feminists of her time. The Feminine Mystique was a New York Times bestseller. It was published in 1963. And in it, Friedan talks about the unhappiness of white upper-class women who had become housewives and were not really doing more with their lives besides raising children and being wives. And she wanted to think about the sexism of US culture and the limitations that women had during this era. Murray and Friedan began to hatch a plan to form what was known, what Murray called the NAACP, but for women. In June of 1966, they went to a conference on women's rights and then all met afterwards in Betty Friedan's hotel room. It's there that they launched the National Organization for Women, or NOW. Initially, this organization was meant to be a group that would provide free legal representation to women who are experiencing sexist discrimination and employment. But eventually, and today, it's one of the most, the largest women's organizations in existence. It's still in existence today. Um, and it's an international women's rights organization that uh, was a big part, is in big part in existence because of the work of Polly Murray. But once again, Murray found that although found the founder of NOW, which is what people call the National Organization for Women, um, they didn't have a home there. Instead, Murray's time with NOW was quite short-lived. Murray found that the organization was consistently sidelining all issues that had to do with racial inequity and economic injustice. It seemed like her friend, who she thought was her friend, Betty Friedan, wasn't interested in talking about issues that had to do with racism and sexism. And instead, as Murray talked about, the NAACP for women that she so passionately had created had become an NAACP for professional white women. Murray left and was very disillusioned with social justice work in general. In particular, Murray wanted to find a place and a home that would accept all of who Murray was, not just portions of who Murray was. And one of the things that I find interesting about Murray's parting from now is that today, the National Organization for Women still does not cite Murray as being one of their co-founders. Murray has been written out of their history. I argue part of that is because there's a desire to make sure that Betty Friedan still looks good. And Betty Friedan was not only racist and classist in her approach to social justice work, she was also deeply homophobic. Many biographers don't want to recognize that Polly Murray was queer. Polly Murray was in love with other women. At the time of 1966, had been in a relationship with another woman for 20 years. This is a big part of Murray's life. And at this time that she was building this organization with Betty Friedan, Betty Friedan was going on a national speaking tour saying that gay and lesbian persons were a threat to the nation, that they were not to be trusted. And she called lesbians in particular the lavender menace. When people talk about Murray's life, they forget that Murray was in fact LGBTQ identified. 
and they don't recognize that the harm that Friedan did was not just because of racism or classism, but also because of homophobia. Murray left because she was being personally attacked at every corner by one of her dearest friends who was destroying the organization she had dreamed of for years. Murray's position as an LGBTQ person in history has to be made visible because we can't fully understand both Murray's legacy and also the reason that Murray made certain choices. Murray, as I've indicated throughout this talk, is somebody whose gender and sexuality is not entirely clear, especially if we don't want to be anachronistic in how we apply LGBTQ concepts to Murray. In most of Murray's writings, this conversation, or writings about Murray, people leave this conversation entirely out. Some of the biggest biographies of Murray's life don't mention it at all, even though Murray was in long-term relationships with women for majority of their life and talked extensively in their private writings about not identifying as being female. So here's what we know. In their journals, Murray wondered, and this is a quote, if maybe they were one of nature's experiments, a girl who should have been a boy. Murray sought medical treatment, consulted doctors, particularly talked about how they think they had what was known as an inverted sex instinct, which was the language that most people utilized to talk about gender dysphoria in the 1940s. Murray asked doctors to test their hormone levels to see if there was an imbalance or something physically wrong with them. And Murray asked for gender affirming uh, surgeries and medicine, including testosterone. They never received any of these treatments. They were denied at every turn and pathologized, so much so that Murray felt as though they were monstrous and that they didn't belong in mainstream society. Murray underwent and result, as a result from this multiple mental health breakdowns, was constantly battling depression, and really didn't have support for the complexity of who they were in a period that didn't recognize being trans or being LGBTQ as anything other than a mental illness. Murray only married a man once, it was for a very short time, and in their diaries, they talked about how being with a man causes them to feel like they need to fight. Instead, they maintained long-term partnerships with women, Peg Holmes and Irene Barlow. Murray didn't identify as a lesbian, though. Um, they were concerned about the connotation of that term. That shouldn't be surprising for you since you saw how Betty Friedan talked about lesbians. It was not a term that people thought of as being um, a happy association. Instead, Murray said that they believed that they were masculine and that they were attracted to women who were attracted to their masculinity. And that's how they identified their sexuality. As a historian of the queer past, it's really hard to know what to do with Murray. You don't want to map current ideas of gender sexuality onto Murray, because that would be anachronistic and further silence Murray's experiences. But it's still important to recognize that Murray was queerly positioned, that's a term that we would use today. They lived, identified, and experienced life outside of the gender binary and outside of heteronormativity. We can't claim exactly to know what Murray would identify as as today, but we do know that their life was at those intersections and that queerness was part of those intersections. Murray wrote extensively about how hard this was for them. Here's one quote from their diary. Every time I try to navigate who I am, this conflict rises up to knock me down at every apex I reach in my career. I have asked my doctors, anything you can do to help me will be gratefully appreciated because my life is somewhat unbearable in its present phase. Murray's difficulties demonstrate the sheer resilience needed to survive, let alone thrive, when you live at those intersections of oppression. To the nation, activist movements, the world of the law, the educational world, and more, there was constant barriers put in Murray's way. For someone like Murray, every win was a long-fought battle, and every turn was fraught with harm, rejection, and depression, harms that were both interpersonal and institutional. And it cannot be ignored that these intersections of oppression ultimately pushed Murray out of social justice work and into their final role, of becoming an Episcopalian priest. As Murray battled with Friedan and others for a far more intersectional national organization for women, Murray's long-term partner of 20 years, Irene Barlow, died. They had been together for two decades, 
and they shared a deep love of social justice work and Christianity. Many people who profile Murray's life don't even mention Irene Barlow or talk about the fact that they lived together for 20 years and that literally five days after her death, Murray did something that most academics would find shocking. For the first time in Murray's life, she had a position that was stable. She was a tenured professor at Brandeis University in American Studies. And within five days of Irene Barlow dying, she resigned her professorship. She decided that she did not want to be a teacher anymore and instead wanted to de dedicate her life to Christianity, Episcopalian, Episcopal uh, beliefs in particular. She entered New York's General Theological Seminary to become an Episcopal priest. Per usual, Murray was blazing uncut trails. The church did not ordain women. But while Murray was in divinity school, the church's general convention voted to change that policy, and that was effective on January 1st, 1977, three weeks after Murray would complete their coursework. On January 8th, in a ceremony in the National Cathedral, Murray became the first African-American woman to be vested as an Episcopal priest. Murray never received a permanent posting as a priest. They bounced between positions for several years and eventually came down with pancreatic cancer, dying in Pittsburgh on July 1st, 1985. After their death, Murray's companion autobiography was published and many of their other writings have been republished over recent years. But Murray's legacy is still one that we have not fully uncovered. For all of their achievements, Murray didn't feel like they ever did enough. They often wrote about not doing enough to change all the inequities they were seeing in American society. In 1970, they are quoted as saying the following, and this is historic language, just as a reference here. If anyone should ask a Negro woman in America what has been her greatest achievement, her honest answer would be, I survived. And truly that survival is not only inspiring, but an incredibly important legacy for understanding historic and current social justice work. Like many at the intersections, Murray's life has never been fully recognized, with parts of their identity remaining hidden according to those profiling their contributions in the world. And yet Murray can be seen as one of the first to publicly challenge racial segregation, to write and challenge intersections of racism and sexism, inspire many activists, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who credits Murray with making her become a feminist, and carve out love and happiness despite a world where their gender and sexuality were often viewed as being incomprehensible. To me, we have so much more to learn from Murray. Lessons on innovative activism, on intersectional oppression, and on resilience in the face of so much dehumanizing harm. I want to close with a quote that I find very inspiring I use in most of my classes from Murray. I hope you'll use this quote and Murray's life to help you think a little bit more about the world, the intersections of oppression in it, and the way we can fight to make it more equitable for all, no matter what you, who you are or where you come from. Murray notes that true community is based upon equality, mutuality, and reciprocity. It affirms the richness of individual diversity, as well as the common human ties that bond us together. Thank you so much.